With Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine resulting in what's become the first war to be largely televised and video recorded, Ukraine has become ground zero for how technology is reshaping history's narratives and the story of politics, war and conflict. I think every military in the world and every intelligence service in the world is going to school on this and hopefully in a, in a good way. I mean, for sure, we're learning a lot about the not there there of the Russian army. But on top of that, again, I think whether it's with Western help or not, they're combining technology that already exists in ways that are, are going to be game changing. Hello, everyone. I'm Chitra Raghavan, and this is Techtopia. I have two amazing guests today to talk about how technology is shaping human history and how it will be told. Brian Cunningham and Alex Dean are co-hosts of a wonderful new podcast, Hidden History Happy Hour, available on YouTube and all the major podcast platforms. My dear friend Brian is a frequent guest both on this podcast and on my leadership podcast, When It, ha when it Mattered. Brian, welcome again to Techtopia. Thank you, Chitra. I believe, I hope I'm the first three-timer and I can ace out our friend Mike Hurley for that honor. <laughs> <laughs> Not that you're competitive, but yes, this is true. You are the first three-timer. Excellent. I'm glad to drag my friend Alex Dean on as well. Yes, and Alex, I'm so delighted to to welcome you. Um, I, let me introduce you to the, the audience here. Uh, Alex Dean is the author of the best-selling nonfiction book, Lessons from History, Hidden Heroes and Villains from the Past and What We Can Learn About Them. And the book inspired the Hidden History Happy Hour podcast. Alex, welcome to Techtopia. Great to be with you. Big fan of your podcast. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how this book, Lessons from History, came to be. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so I live in London normally, uh, but the book uh, began in Suffolk, which is where I grew up. It's the, If you think of the UK and the bulge that's above uh, London, uh, that's called East Anglia. And the, the top bit of that bulge is called Norfolk. And the bottom bit of that bulge is called Essex, which is where a lot of people might know. And the bit in the middle, uh, which is very rural, is called Suffolk. And that's where I grew up. That's where I'm from. And um, during lockdown, um, which was a pretty difficult time for us in the UK, as I'm sure it was to, for wherever your listeners are, where they are too. Um, my father was um, in his last days and I went back and lived with my um, parents for his final months. And it was a hard time, Chitra, but it was also a, um, it was also a good time in a lot of ways. And I, I got, had some good time with my dad and um, he was a big history fan. And um, the nature of, of his final illness was such that he, he slept quite a lot. So I was kind of seeking distractions and I was seeking something to do. And I was in rural Suffolk and none of my friends were around. So I, uh, I sort of started tweeting and um, social media gets a hard time, but I actually found it um, quite an outlet. And I started tweeting stories from history. I honestly didn't know if I was going to do five. You know, I was just t telling a few tales and I wondered if anyone was interested. And actually, it turned out there was a huge number of people in online who um, love history as much as I do, oftentimes knew a great deal more about it. And um, soon enough, within a dozen of those stories, I had a, um, I had a book deal uh, with the UK's leading political publisher, which is called Bite Back. Uh, there are 94 stories in the book. Uh, there's a clutch more stories on uh, on my Twitter that uh, aren't in the book. There are some stories in the book that aren't on Twitter, uh, so as to ensure that my readers got something um, extra. But the main thing about it is, Chitra, that it was your, your Techtopia is so uh, good a platform for me to talk about this because for a work of history, it, it was surprisingly modern. It was a lot of the stories were effectively crowdsourced. After the first dozen, 15, I, I was writing stories because people were suggesting them and saying, I love this story or could this one's kind of got echoes of that other one that you told. Uh, and so whilst there are 94 in the book, um, about, about half and half were stories I came up with on my own and half were stories that were suggested by my readers and definitely the majority of the stories were vastly improved by my uh, readers on online. So the stories cumulatively have been read a few million times on Twitter, but um, the, that was a, a real interesting feedback on that because my, my, my readers were on Twitter were telling me as much about the stories as I was telling them. That's really interesting. And, and the fact that I was thinking the fact that it you it originated on Twitter also kind of epitomizes how history is being written in many ways, especially over the past few years uh, with, uh, you know, former President Donald Trump kind of taking to Twitter to basically 
you know, right public policy, foreign foreign policy, and in all, and and eventually, you know, uh, sort of politics. So it is very very interesting that how this book originated. Thank you very much. I I really uh, appreciate it. Uh, there may be a volume two, but right now I am loving uh, the podcast, um, which Brian and I. Uh, co-host and we've had some great guests and I hope we can return a favor and have you on our podcast one day. I would love to. Uh, Brian, many of my regular listeners are familiar with your background from your previous appearances, but for our new listeners, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, just building on what Alex said, I like to think of myself now as the co-director of the Alex Dean Vast Improvement Project, <laughs> which apparently is uh, is now underway. I uh, I was a career CIA officer, as your listeners know. I also uh, have dabbled in the arts from time to time. I'm a uh, former professional drummer, screenwriter, uh, and um, also someone who's been pretty involved in technology for the last couple decades. Alex and I are great old friends. We know each other from uh, the uh, Palantir, which Chitra, you're also a veteran of. In fact, I believe I recruited both of you to Palantir. So <laughs> I, will, I will take some credit for that. And I also am a descendant of UFO writers, as your, as your uh, listeners know. And I think there's a little lesson for history in that as well. Yes, and we're going to conclude with that story. But how did this uh, podcast, Hidden History Happy Hour, come about from the title? I imagine some form of alcoholic stimulant may have been involved. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my favorite, yeah, my favorite podcasts over the years are the ones where you not only learn something, but you don't really realize you're learning something because you're having enough fun on the way that you don't feel like things are being jammed down your throat. And also the kind where you feel a certain degree of intimacy and connection with the hosts. And so Alex and I have been having these barroom pub conversations for a decade or more, and they're intellectual to some extent, they're earthy to some extent. We're, we're a family-friendly podcast, but we sometimes uh, sway off into um, profanity. Uh, often they're, they're friendly uh, contention, but they're just a blast. And so it came to me one day reading Alex's book that maybe there'd be a few people around who would not only enjoy eavesdropping on and in our live events, participating in our kind of banter back and forth, but also learning history in a way that's meaningful, connected to today, but also fun. And, and part of the fun comes from the fact that every episode we try to quaff some of the alcohol that are either our, our subjects of our stories might have drank or we love and we want to introduce to the world or now in the case of one of the ones that we love sponsors us. And so we try to have fun with history and that's pretty much it. And it's uh, thankfully caught on. Yeah, I tell you, tell you one thing, Chitra, and I, the, the book is mine. The idea for the podcast is Brian, so all, all credit to, to Brian. But he also cleverly designed this idea that the alcohol we chose would be themed around our uh, the subjects. Uh, little did I realize how calculating our former CIA officer is, and I should have done, <laughs> because a large number of my stories are about naval battles or naval history and naval uh, heroes. And I'm not a big rum drinker, but Chitra, I give you a hundred guesses we work out who is <laughs> <laughs> and you know i was thinking it's great when these are evening book tapings but i wonder how it works out when you have to record it in the morning and you have to like be true to your name of your podcast and and do your happy hour in the mornings well, well Brian, I, over to you <laughs> <laughs> i i like to say that i am considerably more dedicated to the show than alex because alex gets to enjoy our show usually around 9 p.m his time and I get to enjoy it usually around 1 p.m. my time, which is manageable, although my partner would tell you that the rest of the day is perhaps not as productive <laughs> as it might otherwise be. And I may or may not have some scars to show for it, but it's also occasionally more convenient for Alex and or our guest to record at 10 a.m. my time. And that starts to get a little bit grisly. But again, my dedication shows through. I still enjoy uh, the beverage. You're the real hero, Brian. <laughs> and, hidden and hero. Very yes, hidden. hidden hero. And I think that the audience notes it too. <laughs> um, so, you know, the timing of your podcast could not have been better, I think, in the, in the sense that 
if correct me if I'm wrong, but you launched the podcast just around the time that Russian President Vladimir Putin was launching his invasion of Ukraine. And I imagine it probably left you both scrambling a bit to find this giant historic news peg kind of dropped in your lap. Yeah, I, I, I have talked about this a few times on the podcast and, you know, it, people that have listened to it will, will hopefully tell you that we have a very light tone and we don't take ourselves very seriously. But I, I at least, I won't speak for Alex, went through a bit of a metamorphosis because when this started in January of 2022, it was a fun project. It was a labor of love with one of my best friends, but, you know, it was entertainment and hopefully it still is entertainment. And then all of a sudden we found ourselves in the middle of this kind of hinge of history potentially. And we, at least I felt like we should bring the stories home to this massive current event as much as we could. And maybe, you know, 200 years from now, our podcast will have a tiny little role in, in historians uh, research, but more importantly, try to give our listeners some context and some way to process this thing, which, I think most everyone on the planet would have said could not happen in the 21st century in which I at least believe, Alex may differ with me, but I at least believe the way this turns out will determine the rest of the 21st century for very good or for very ill. I don't demur from any of that. Um, in the last episode we published, we talked about how the Spanish Civil War, whilst contained to Iberia in its um, uh, actual fighting, um, was so closely watched because of the um, future it was deemed to potentially promise for uh, humanity as a whole and for the way that the 1940s would be shaped. And um, and so it came to pass. And it, that, at least, I think there's an interesting parallel with what's happening um, right now. There are, I, I think there are very few people who who don't get the importance of Ukraine and the way that we deal with uh, tyrannical regimes willing to invade their their neighbours. But so I think most people understand the huge significance of what's um, going on. I completely agree that we're standing on the hinge of history and watching um, what's going to determine a great deal of, of the rest of, of this century. I also think, though, that... Um, Brian has great force in what he says about people not being able, people not expecting this to happen in this day and age. People thinking it's impossible. You know, we've we've got our economies too closely intertwined. We, uh, we civilization is now everywhere. Everyone watches the same things and listens to the same music. We, really, you know, a hard conflict that's basically not going to happen anymore well uh, as so often it demonstrates that there is no end of history and and actually just when you think it can't get worse uh, in the way that people behave uh, man to man against man it does and I think your book also is so symbolic of Ukraine in some ways because your book is all about the little guy who did amazing things in history. Often people didn't even know for decades what these these um, um, hidden heroes did. And in Ukraine, you hear these stories day after day of average people, the fishmonger, the baker, uh, the the tailor. You know these people who are putting in their little bit towards um, saving their country. Thank you. Oh, it's, uh, that's that's right. I think. Sorry, go ahead, Brian. Well, I, yeah, kudos to the book on that score, as, as well as many others. I, I was going to just say that the victors write the history, right? And so, as Alex and I have often talked about, we don't hear historically about the failures because uh, they don't get recorded. Well, now everything's getting recorded. And while there's a certain amount of propaganda on each side, I, I believe that the Ukrainian reporting is far more accurate than the Russian reporting, needless to say. But you do see these stories of failure and of success, and they're documented for all time now. It's not like whoever wins that war, and I fervently hope and pray every night it's going to be Ukraine. I believe it is with, with uh, our help and the UK's help and others. But these everyday tales of heroism that are just literally unfolding in front of us on the internet are amazing. For example, fun fact, Chitra, I'm not sure if you're aware of this. We haven't talked about this on the podcast, I don't think. But Ukraine actually passed a law. So their legislature is functioning in the midst of all this, something that Putin uh, deeply regrets. And they actually passed a law early on <laughs> that said, you do not have to pay taxes on the property gained from your confiscated Russian tanks and personnel carriers and weapons. You <laughs> get those as a freebie. 
Oh, I love I love it. Um, I I thought about your point about the little guy when um, Snake Island, sometimes referred mm -hmm. to as Serpent Island, mounted that tremendous act of defiance against the Russian warship that then gave them a pasting, which of course was later sunk. And um, and I, I didn't write it in one of my Dean histories because it's too immediate and it's it would have felt um, cheap. But the point about the kind of by or cheap on my part, of course, mm -hmm. is what I mean. Um, but the, the part of the point of my book about the stories of the little guys that one day, sad to say, that symbolism of Snake Island, Serpent Island will not be front of mind. And it'll need somebody to write a story like the kind of stories I write to remember the heroism of those men. And one other side point, uh, all three of us like a little footnote. Um, sure. I um, I note that what the story that hasn't been told is that Snake Island, as far as the last census of Ukraine says, was actually also populated, not just with soldiers. There was a little village on the island, and that's a story we've never heard. And that's one I'd mm -hmm. like to know what happened to those people. I'd like to know that one and perhaps tell that one day. Well, the the island, as we as we speak, is very disputed. Uh, there's fighting about it all the time, a military action around it. And I, I trust and hope that Ukraine will take that back and that those people uh, escape uh, unscathed. One other thing I just wanted to, to note, though, about what's happening in Ukraine, and it's by now an obvious point, but it's sort of an amazing one. And that is, and this is reflected in a number of the stories and lessons from history, the effect of a highly motivated, highly energized people defending something they really care about can overcome almost unbelievable odds. Mm. The fact that this conflict is going the way it's going in, in, in the mid year of 2022 with Ukraine doing so miraculously well, yes, it's in part the weapons that we in, in Britain and others sent in. And yes, it's the, some of the training that we all did. We, I'm, I'm not a military person, our countries did in the last five years in Ukraine. But it's really about those guys on Snake Island who said, F the Russians. I think yours is more of a family podcast than ours, Chitra, so I will censor <laughs> myself, who said F the Russians, which became a meme. It's also about all the people. This is one of my favorite things about this conflict. Not that we should find joy in it, but you know, very famously during World War II, the, uh, the Europeans in many of the countries took down all their road signs and put up fake ones to try to confuse the Germans on their way in. And the Ukrainians took that one step farther, but they didn't even bother to put up fake ones. They just took them all down and put up <laughs> signs that said, F you, Russia, go back to Russia, all kinds of variations of that. So the, it's, it's, it sounds like a little thing, but the spirit of it and the optimism and the Churchillian way, if I can steal that, Alex, that Zelensky has rallied his people, but yet in his own unique way as a former comedian, I think sure. that has a lot to do with how well they're doing. I agree. And I think the Churchill Leon Echo is deliberate. I think he's he's consciously cast yeah. himself in that mold with the words he's chosen. If you, you know, the taking down the street signs is a very sort of a, a, an incredibly smart, uh, but, you know, like a simple gesture. But if you go back to looking at how the Ukrainian government is using technology, they have ha they have a very uh, sort of a um, healthy tech sector, a growing yeah. tech sector. And so you, you hear about how they're using facial recognition, uh, mm -hmm. controversial, but interesting to see that in the middle of war, they're able to use facial recognition technology to identify uh, the faces of the soldiers who were killed, um, often exhuming them again after they were buried in order to identify them and return them to their families for a proper burial. Uh, you know, they, they're, they've they been very, very good, as you've noted, Brian, at sort of the propaganda and counter-propaganda element. Uh, and, and, and then on the other hand, you also have these, and Brian, you are like a great expert on this with your deep cybersecurity background. You've got these hundreds of thousands of, I don't even know how many white hat hackers who have mm -hmm. broken through the Russian internet firewalls to get the message out to everyday Russians about what Putin is doing, you know, to hapless, innocent citizens of Ukraine. So technology is really sort of woven into this narrative. Uh, and I don't know if there are other examples in history that, that show this kind of uh, um, interwoven uh, a narrative uh, rooted in technology and technological strength. Well, let me just, I'm going to throw the historical question to Alex, although uh, uh, archery comes to mind, and we've told a story about that. But 
I, I wanted to say about the technology and the creativity happening in Ukraine, look at the way they're using drones. Yeah. Uh, you know, they are teaching the U.S. military something right now. And that is that is that is saying something. And look at the way uh, they're using the not only facial recognition technology, but GPS technology. And as you as you mentioned, Chitra, uh, cyber capabilities, I would also note even our United States somewhat sclerotic, in my view, Department of Justice, and I think that's true across different administrations, has just issued a ruling as we speak in May of 2022, that they're going to kind of look the other way at white hat hackers. As long as you, you know, coordinate a little bit with the government and you don't harm an American company, eh, it's probably okay. That pesky computer fraud and abuse act, we're going to look the other way. And it doesn't say it, but it is 100% targeted at protecting Americans who hack Russians in Ukraine. In my opinion, I don't know, I'm not in the government, but it's a, can't be a coincidence. Over to you, Alex. Um, necessity is the mother of invention. Mm -hmm. And so one might uh, naturally think the Ukrainians are coming up with things in dire straits that are you know, inventive and creative. But I think too, it may be the case that some Western powers are helping rather more than your uh, position suggests. And uh, whilst it may, of course, be that the Ukrainians are simply um, delivering and performing remarkable acts of military and uh, achievement and intelligence achievement, I wonder if uh, there isn't some rather more hefty support than that, um, than that position might imply. One no. would hope. And now, you know, other ways technology is sort of rewriting history is you now have, you know, this narrative and propaganda and counter propaganda being shaped, you know, not in days or weeks, but minute by minute, often second by second with the advent of social media platforms like Twitter and Meta. And now Telegram is being used in a big way, especially by the Ukrainian government to get the message out. Um, even by British intelligence to to get out the message on on what what um, Russian positions are and how how Russia is doing compared to Ukraine, um, and and that is something very different, uh, you know. Given that this is, as you noted, Brian, what, the first major war to be largely televised and and videotaped and streamed and and all of that. So with social media organizations like Twitter and Meta, Telegram, and of course Elon Musk's satellites. Uh, this is a whole, this is a game changer, right? I think every military in the world and every intelligence service in the world is going to school on this and hopefully in a, in a good way. I mean, for sure, we're learning a lot about the not there there of the Russian army. But on top of that, again, I think whether it's with Western help or not, they're combining technology that already exists in ways that are, are going to be game changing. One thing I would note about the uh, sort of British intelligence and US intelligence, the way they're operating during this conflict, it's quite incredible um, the way that the US intelligence community and the British are on the spot declassifying and releasing to the public and the world uh, data that, you know, even in the Afghanistan war, even in the last Iraq war, I was sitting in the chair that would have decided what was going to be disclassified, one declassified, one of, one of the chairs wouldn't have decided on my own. And uh, it's incredible. And at first, you know, as a career intelligence officer, I was kind of aghast at this. I mean, sources and methods and who, you know, who are we getting killed here? But it really has had uh, an astounding positive effect. I hope we didn't sacrifice the lives of any human assets. I think this is probably electronic intelligence, which is still sensitive, but people's lives don't depend on it. But the way, especially the US intelligence community has been out there minute by minute releasing information and especially the way that they telegraphed the Russian playbook in detail before Russia ever tried to do it. So the dog that never barked in this conflict is uh, Russia staging some big flashy propaganda based uh, uh, you know, attack on itself in Ukraine that would have justified in the they would think in the world of public opinion them going in that never happened and I think it largely never happened because every we in the British told the world it was going to happen which mm. sort of took the sting out of it before it ever happened interesting counterfactual and what what does it mean though for the writing of history if you have the this 
unfolding minute by minute on social media. What does that mean for history, Alex? Uh, I think it, it can make it both easier and harder. I mean, immediate caveat, of course, I'm not an historian. I'm by no means a, you know, I'm not even an undergraduate level that I do history. I'm just that most English of things, an enthusiastic amateur. Um, but I'm able to, to speculate on your fascinating question because it's the world we're all living in. Once the trouble for history writing was not enough sources, now the trouble's going to be too many. And when some of those sources are semi-ephemeral, it's going to be tricky to ascertain and can be erased or deleted. It's going to be difficult to ascertain sometimes uh, what happened and when. But, you know, once something's on the Internet, it's almost impossible to destroy. And that actually gives me hope in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. you know, once human knowledge can be parked somewhere that is so diffuse and so hard to damage, humanity lost enormous things of value beyond uh, the possibility to comprehend when libraries burnt in the ancient world or when, uh, you know, in the Second World War, when cities were bombed flat we lost huge things that can never be replaced that were literally priceless but much of the knowledge we have now and indeed the knowledge we've preserved from then is safe in a different way mm -hmm. because the modern way of storing knowledge is such that it almost can't be destroyed at least in its um virtual sense even if it can still be destroyed in the physical which to me is something that's worth it, it outweighs any of the cost of the challenges of trying to work out what history tells us from, you know, the difficulties of having to navigate through so much social media and so forth. Uh, and the other thing I'd say about social media is that it can give you, you, you mentioned President Trump and uh, whatever we think of the virtues and failings of, of Presidents Trump and Biden, and you could spend many a podcast weighing those two up. Mm -hmm. President Trump had much better Twitter game uh, than mm -hmm. President Biden. I can't help but notice from the outside. And I, what I was going to say about social media was that it can give you an an insight into the thinking of uh, of somebody. Well, my God, there was no filter on your last president, was there? Uh, and actually, that's going to be very interesting for historians of the future to look back on. Yeah, and, and directly related to that is the question that historians are probably asking right now, but they're going to have to ask 100 years from now also is, what is the authentic it, right? So, you know, up until President Trump, pretty much the definitive history of what a U.S. president or a British prime minister uh, did is, is contained in the documents they signed the proclamations, the executive orders, the legislation that they signed. But it's always been the case under U.S. law that a president can make policy decisions, can announce new things that are binding any way they want, including just standing up and giving a speech. You know, President Biden a few days ago here in May of 2022 publicly said that the U.S. will support Taiwan militarily in the event of a Chinese invasion. What is the force of that? It's not a signed proclamation, but it's going to be there 100 years from now. And even more so, President Trump, you know, announcing hundreds of very significant new policy decisions by tweet. The historian 100 years from now won't be able to find a document signed by him, but they'll have his words in a public tweet. And they'll have to ask, well, was this actually U.S. policy? And the way they'll figure that out is what happened afterwards. And a significant percentage of President Trump's tweets never amounted to anything policy-wise, but a significant percentage of them did. You know, written documents were changed. The activities of our diplomats changed as a result. So, you know, it, it's a it's a blessing and a curse, I think, for future historians. But it's got to mean that they'll have more to work with, and it also will undermine the ability of victors to erase the history of the losers. And I think also it puts a, a, a new uh, level of pressure potentially on technology companies to preserve these kinds of records. I don't, uh, I, I don't know, Brian, you may know better because of your um, long history in, in the U.S. government, but it would seem that if, if, for instance, President Trump was so good as, as Alex said, his Twitter game was, you know, was really good uh, in that he was, he, everything for him unfolded on Twitter sometimes you know, um, dozens, if not hundreds of Twitters, tweets a day, um, and that's a day. Uh, how do we go back and preserve all that for historians? And now, as you know, the, uh, the the President Trump is under investigation potentially for documents that were not sent back to the National Archives when his term ended. And so when you, and then there have also been reports in the press 
that confirmed reports that um, he was fond of ripping up uh, legal documents and and records of history and and essentially flushing them down the toilet. Right. So when you have things like that happen, and you also have the pace at which policy is being set on Twitter or other social media platforms, in his case, Twitter, uh, it, it raises everything to a whole different level. Well, first, let me just, I can't help but try to be bipartisan here. Uh, we try to do that on the show or nonpartisan. Um, uh, today, we learned today, uh, May 24th or 5th, whatever date it is. Um, today, we learned that um, President Trump's chief of staff, uh, reportedly his deputy was burning mm -hmm. highly sensitive documents in the White House fireplace. And we've talked in some ways in a positive way about Trump, but we've sort of gone after him for his theft mm -hmm. of documents. And if he stole classified documents or historical documents, he should be prosecuted for them. But I can't help but note that one of the biggest things that came out of the 9-11 Commission investigation, which I was a part of, was the pleading guilty to a federal crime of President Clinton's national security advisor, Sandy Berger, also a lawyer, who stole top secret code word documents from the National Archives solely to keep them from the 9-11 Commission so they wouldn't learn about some embarrassing, Good potentially damaging I information. I never knew that. You don't know that, Alex? Oh, no, yeah. I didn't. It was, it was, a, it was big... a huge story at the time and astonishing how it had unfolded. And, and just now that we're into this, Alex, uh, what he did physically was he took documents out of the National Archives, stuffed them in his suit, and while on his lunch break from looking at documents in the National Archives, and he hid them under a, a truck on Pennsylvania Avenue on a live construction site. So all day long until he retrieved them to take them home and rip them up and burn them in his fireplace, they were sitting there underneath the construction crew. Good, good grief. And do we, I mean, just, was he, do we now have some kind of reconstruction of the knowledge that he destroyed? Well, this is one of the most interesting parts of the whole story. And damn it, Chitra, I should save this for our podcast. But my belief, uh, I don't, I don't, have access to the classified reporting about that. And if I did, I couldn't talk about it. But my very strong belief, having been involved in the process, is he didn't steal 12 documents. He stole 12 copies of the same document. And that document would have been extremely damaging to the Clinton administration had the 9-11 Commission considered it in their work. And I strongly believe he was trying to erase every trace of it, which to circle back and connect up to our conversation would be much harder to do today. Right. I think that, you know, going back over decades, there have been so many examples on both sides of how uh, U.S. government documents are handled and 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 you know returned, sent to the National Archives, preserved for posterity. I, it could be like a series of podcasts, but it just goes to show how um, you know all of this becomes so complex when you layer it with the fact that now a lot of the stuff, uh, thanks in large part to how President Trump used Twitter, uh, and he was a master at it. Um, you combine those two and you realize that the weight upon historians and the National Archives and other people responsible for preserving history has grown in, in leaps and bounds. Yeah, well, to circle back to your question about the responsibility of social media companies to preserve things, I actually don't think that's the problem. Because as Alex alluded, once something is on the interwebs, as I would say as a grumpy old man, uh, it's very <laughs> difficult to get it off. There are copies stored everywhere, way outside the ambit of Twitter for tweets, for example. So I don't think that's the problem. I think the problem is going to be how you 100 or 200 years from now sort out the authentic tweets and Facebook postings and whatever the future technology is from the altered ones. I think the game is going to become not so much getting rid of evidence, so to speak, because that's going to be pretty clearly impossible, but f having fake versions of it. And I promise you, in the 2024 presidential campaign in the United States, there will be more than one completely fabricated uh, ad by a political candidate where it's a deep fake, so-called deep fake. You take video of the person, you splice it together, you edit it, you make it look real. And uh, if, if anybody wants to check this out, there's a, if you just, if you Google Obama deep fake, some oh, startup, yeah, it's very good. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. And if anybody doesn't think this has real consequences, 
there was a long-standing, may still be, economic embargo against the government of, I believe, Qatar, uh, because a, a statement aired on Qatari state television by their leader adopting many like pro-Israeli positions and other things that would really have gotten him in serious trouble with his population as a as a as a Muslim leader there. And there it was, maybe still as an economic embargo against Qatar by many of their neighbors. And an economic embargo, as we've learned in history, can be one or two steps short of a shooting war. But here's the thing, he never made that speech. His enemies broke into the state TV archives and clipped together f footage of him to make this phony speech and then had enough control over the TV network to air it. And that will not be the last time. No. Gosh, that is what astonishing. Yeah. That's a great story, Brian. Yeah. Well, maybe that should be an at uh, hashtag Dean history someday soon. Maybe. I think that's a good idea. So another way in which, you know, when you look at Ukraine, what's happening with the documenting of history is the physical papers, right? I mean, when entire cities are getting turned into dust, essentially, in, in Ukraine, there must be like a wealth of historic papers, videos, artifacts in museums, art galleries, you know, all of this is getting destroyed. And in these large population centers, uh, and I know there have been a lot of efforts to like get all the stuff out of harm's way. But I wonder, Alex, if we're going to lose a large kind of chunk of Ukraine's narrative and history in the process, or will the electronic record clipping and cloud storage save at least the paperwork, even if not the, a lot of the physical objects of history? Well, let's reassure ourselves with how we've been able to deal with destruction before. In much of Europe, um, people rebuilt buildings as they were and where they were afterwards. Even really, you know, um, ornate buildings that were, were challenging and hard to design. And before we had, you know, digital technology to take pictures of them and be able to, to recreate the, every angle and, and so forth. And, and that on the one hand gives me hope of course much of my country rebuilt in the 1950s understandably desperately and um and keen to repair bomb damages they've all built shoddily and, and shoved stuff up to take the place of uh, of uh, in the gaping holes of what was missing and my point is chitra that doesn't just happen with buildings when you are missing things when you when you lose part of your culture you have to take great care as you rebuild to ensure that the the quality is there because otherwise you'll wind up with a with a stunted impression of what you've lost and that's where i have huge confidence again because the goodwill towards ukraine right around the world mm -hmm. means that i think it's going to become a case study in building back better an overused term but one i think truly is going to apply in ukraine's future i think they're going to be able to rebuild their the, the magnificent buildings that they've lost in places like mariupol even better than than the, what the Russians callously and cynically and destructively knocked down, uh, because they're going to have to the support of the world to do it. And I, I take to your point, your interesting um, question about the challenges that exists for those who uh, run archives and seek to maintain a knowledge and understanding of the past. Um, like a lot of geeks and, and nerds, I'm a science fiction fan as, as brian knows and um there's an old um science fiction novel by a guy called brian stableford called cradle of the sun in which the his the, the the hero an unlikely hero is the librarian and he's the keeper of the last library library on earth but the libraries aren't just for books by the time humanity's um dusk approaches they're for everything you try and preserve everything in your library and um I think that we've actually, in ways that they wouldn't have expected when you wrote something like that, our digital transformation means that libraries increasingly do seek to keep everything. They seek to keep records of um, the way that buildings uh, are and the way that streets looked and the way that, um, you know, because we have this incredible archive of, of and satellite imagery and, and, um, and, and topography, because we have this uh, data that's deeper and richer than any of our forebears could have imagined. I'm not, I look, our forebears managed incredible things uh, in innovative ways, necessity being the mother of um, invention as we were already reflecting. 
but uh, they could never have imagined some of the things that we have been blessed with in technology so it's a long way around of saying i'm actually quite optimistic about the future i'm optimistic about ukraine's future once russia is pushed out of it and i believe that it's going to be one of those moments when the world pulls together and thinks look and, and proudly steps back one day and uh, hopefully says look what we did we were able to help these guys restore something really special i i agree with all that i would also add that that, that one of the violations of the laws of armed conflict is to deliberately target cultural centers, which of course the Russia has done in this conflict, one of the, you know, heinous but least heinous of all their war crimes there. And one of the reasons, of course, is that as Alex says, you can build back the building, you can build it back better, you can have all kinds of new encouragement for artists, but the specific pieces of art and sculpture and design that are inside those buildings, I fear are, are irreplaceable, except for the ones that may be recorded on NFTs, which is something Chitra, I know you know a lot more about than I do, but there was a, there was a painting recently that sold for some crazy amount of money that what you're paying for is the non-fungible token of the painting. And I don't really even understand the technology enough to totally get it, but obviously, if art is in the form of a non-fungible token and those are stored on the blockchain, then they're probably as historically secure as tweets. They're probably, you know, undestroyable because the whole idea of blockchain is that there's many layers of, of mathematical and other protection around such things. I probably totally botched that, Chitra, but there's a point in there somewhere. No, absolutely. I was thinking the same thing that with the advent of blockchain technology, not just with art uh, or other physical representations that you want uh, represented on the on the blockchain, uh, their authenticity, uh, even with historic paperwork and, uh, you know, all of those kinds of archival materials, there one day could be a, an immutable uh, and permanent record of it on the blockchain, which would fundamentally make the task of writing history and, and history's narrative a lot easier. I think that's right. And it's another of the reasons I feel optimistic about uh, these things and, and the future, notwithstanding the fact that we seem as a culture determined to find things uh, about which we can rapidly fall out and find new ways of taking disputes. Um, yeah, it's extraordinary to me that we uh, as we, we see Russia invade Ukraine, about as clear a case of black and white, right and wrong and right uh, as possible. It's extraordinary to me that our culture devotes to it quite so much of its efforts as to which bathrooms which people should use. I mean, I don't even have to express a view on that debate to say, goodness, guys, aren't there more important things? And the variance on that sort of um, dispute. You know, it's not just that we have it, it's that it's so vitriolic. And people come to define themselves by these disputes and the sides on which they put them uh, and devote endless hours to these disputes in, uh, thank goodness, preserved fraternity on social media, um, on, on Twitter and so forth, going at each other. When it seems to me, first of all, there are more important things. And second of all, one of the things we seem to have lost, I think this will be a judgment history passes upon us when hopefully our descendants are more sensible than we are. History will say, look at this weird period when um, people were unable to say, do you know what? Let's agree to disagree. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a horrible loss. And even, again, to sound like grumpy old man from Saturday Night Live, even during my service in the government, when a lot of people thought we had hit the epitome of vitriol over trivial things, it looks like the golden age compared hmm. to what to what it is now. It feels like we were dealing with philosopher kings and queens compared to some of the debates we have now. And I can't help but uh, reflect, Alex, on your point uh, with an, with a, a saying that's often attributed to Kissinger, but I think it actually existed before he did. And now that I've spent a couple of years in academia, I can firmly confirm it, which is that uh, the reason why politics are so fierce in academia is that the stakes are so small. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You know, looking at these, the archival documents, you know, the, the role of the electronic signature replacing the human hand, I wonder, is that something that you all have written about or talked about? We have. We had an amazing guest uh, on the podcast, Zach 
Brown is the CEO of McLaren, uh, widely known, less widely known. He has one of the world's most impressive and uh, important privately held collections of manuscripts. Now, he's got something signed by every president. He, his Nixon one is the resignation letter from Nixon to Kissinger. That's um, amazing that he has The actual that. letter, you know, um, uh, he's got uh, he's Mary. He's a bit grisly, but he's got Mary Queen of Scots death warrant. You know, he's got he, he, mm-hmm. records record, uh, about your uh, mafia in the United States. Uh, quite extensive uh, records. He's got this incredible set of documents. One of Washington's orders of battle, and um, part of the importance of that is that the physical, actual thing. Someone held it. Someone signed it. You know, if somebody signed it, they held it and touched it, and you just don't have the same with the uh, as Donald Rumsfeld discovered of course you do not have the same when something is auto penned yeah, yeah. As, well, as... you know they just um, they just uh, very recently here in May of 2022 the, the White House flew uh, a, the Ukrainian relief legislation to President Biden in South Korea for him to ink sign with ink Literally, completely physically sign yeah. to physically sign completely unnecessary the, the, as as we talked about with Zach Brown, the presidents have been using auto pens for decades, and they did it, I think, because they wanted to say to the world, and particularly to the Chinese who might have their eyes on Taiwan, here's forty billion dollars on top of the money we've already spent. Uh, we're in this for the long haul. So, mm. not to not to diminish the value of of auto penned documents, which legally are the same, or of tweets, which in some cases can have the same legal force, but it's just different when the leader has to sit, look down, take ink and sign the document. It just feels more momentous and we'll probably lose that. It's hard to imagine people are signing things a hundred years from now or 50 years from now or 20 years from now. Yeah. It's extraordinary. The collection that Zach Brown has, it's, uh, and must have, it must've been a labor of love over decades. (laughs) Uh, I, I don't actually think it's that long. Um, he's just, you know, he gets into some auctions, and I think is the, you know, it's a particular. If you're that kind of enthusiast, the eyes light up like a kid in a candy store. And uh, I, so I think it's he's been at it for a few years, but I don't think it's decades. One really interesting thing he said to us, Alex. I think I have this right, is that in some ways <clears throat> it's easier to verify the authenticity of older documents because you can look at the paper that would have existed then you can look at the right. ink that would have existed then you can look at all kinds of other artifacts around the actual signature to determine whether or not it's been manufactured whereas a lot of newer things and obviously this is certainly true for things that are posted on social media there arguably isn't a single copy that's the canonical thing and so i don't know if that makes his i don't think we asked him if that makes him sort of less enthusiastic about collecting modern artifacts but he sure doesn't seem to focus on that no i, I think that's right uh, look uh, look people have been have been hoodwinked with in history several times famously the hitler diaries is a big example of reputable historians um being taken in by fraudsters um people you know find the right paper by dint of cutting out blank sheets from the back of manuscripts uh, indeed violating quite often libraries in order to get that that uh, sheet of, uh, of 16th century paper, which was just filler at the back of a book until someone thought to use it for fraud. They create the, something that looks very like the right ink. They practice a hundred or a thousand times before they apply the, the stroke that's going to be the actual forgery. But you know, so there's always been a bit of a forgery in that sort of documentary world. And I, I think collectors, um, I'm not saying that it was a game, I mean, it must be tragic to find out you've sunk a whole load of money in something that's a, a, a forgery but uh, um a forgery but on the other hand i think it's accepted that you've got to do your due diligence right um there's an artist in the united kingdom um i've got a couple of his works called john myatt um who is now what he would refer to himself as a legitimate forger 
Um, he was a British artist. He was convicted of this enormous art forgery. It was the biggest art fraud of the 20th century. And he, um, after he, a fantastic um, imitator of many uh, painting styles, and after his trial in the Crown Court, so the story goes, um, and after his conviction, and he was sent down for a long stretch to prison, because they made a lot of money from this kind of forgery, he... Um, he was approached by someone who was on the jury who said, would you mind doing, you know, a, a fake Cezanne or a fake Chagall or whatever it was that they, they asked for. And he said, yes. And, and so began his open and, and explicit legitimate forgery career. Um, and he's still out to this day. That's amazing. <laughs> Uh, and by the way, the, the, the Christie's, uh, Christie's was taken in, Sotheby's was taken in, uh, for, yeah, all, all of the big auction houses of, of our day. It, at that time, there were uh, there were Myatt forgeries um, that were circulating and would pay high price. You know, Chagall's, uh, Giacometti's, Matisse's. Um, you know, he was a pretty good forger, and he made a career out of it. He did. Well, we've talked a lot about written documents, uh, you know, and historical artifacts. Brian, as we wrap up, I know you have a very personal and amazing story <laughs> that you've told before on Techtopia a few months ago for people who want to listen to the whole episode. It was episode 12 about a very unique 64-year-old nonfiction book called Flying Saucer Pilgrimage about UFOs and a letter written to President Dwight Eisenhower by your grandparents that serves as an amazing lens into that period of time and sort of the birth of sort of the UFO believer movement, um, which in fact was, uh, you know, in, in a big way led by your grandparents. So tell us a little bit about them and their journey into UFOs and that letter to President Eisenhower and how it kind of fits into this, this discussion. Well, let me first say that if you were to go on Amazon and look for Flying Saucer Pilgrimage, by Bryant and Helen Reed, you would find it's far down the list of popularity from Lessons of History. No. Uh, millions of millions of pegs below, <laughs> but it's uh, it's meaningful to me because in fact Bryant and Helen Reed were my grandparents, and as as your listeners know, Chitra, they took me on a little uh, UFO tour at one point of Mexico of all the sites that they had visited trying to document <laughs> actual cases of UFO sightings. So what you allude to is is in the in the 1950s. And late 40s in the United States, I think a little bit around the world, there was sort of a UFO craze. Imagine going to a music festival like Coachella out in the desert and you got a bunch of big tents and they had these sort of tent revivals of people who claimed that they had been encountered uh, by aliens, whether, you know, seeing lights in the sky or being taken up and probed or whatever it was. <laughs> And so my grandfather and grandmother just kind of, I guess, on a lark, obviously I wasn't born at that time, but they decided to just take a year off. I think my grandfather was semi-retired and drive around North America, uh, including Mexico, which was very heavily into the UFO craze and just interview everybody and make notes of what they told them and then publish a book about it. And along the journey, they became absolutely convinced that uh, flying saucers, as they called them then, UFOs, were regularly visiting Earth and interacting with our people and affecting our history. And they were true believers. And I never got a chance to talk to my grandfather about it, but my grandmother was a true believer until the day she died. And so in the middle of one of their, their tours, uh, President Eisenhower gets a question at a press conference. It was, I believe, December 15th, 1954. And the question was along the lines of, what do we make of all these recent reports of flying saucers? And almost always in history, although President Obama has now, since he left office, talked somewhat openly about it, but almost up until then, the only answer to that question was, we, the U.S. government, have no credible evidence that there were there are flying saucers visiting Earth, which is more or less what President Eisenhower said, and he based it on uh, the uh, advice of an Air Force man who he trusted. Well, my grandparents were outraged by this, and they felt that Eisenhower, who they greatly admired, they called the greatest man occupying the Oval Office since Lincoln, wanted to have their say. So they're in Mexico. They march over to a small little, you know, bodega telegraph office. They spent 52 pesos and 55 centavos, and they sent a telegram <laughs> to President Dwight D. Eisenhower, the White House, Washington, D.C. 
This is sent on December 16th, 1954, and I won't read it, but it essentially it says, you're being given bad advice. You need to look at this more carefully. We know this is happening. It's a free country. You need to inform the people. 1954. So this is essentially, uh, you know, a, two citizens of their government exercising their right to petition their government. And of course, nothing happened. And I think talking with my grandmother later in life, she was very, very disappointed that nothing had happened really, even as of 1985 or whatever, when she died. But lo and behold, two weeks ago or less than two weeks ago in 2022, there was an open hearing in the House of Representatives in which very senior United States Naval officers played videos taken by Naval pilots of unidentified flying objects and said quite openly, you know, there's, I'm making up these numbers, but there's 300 incidents that we've investigated, 261 of them can be explained by weather balloons and such. This is one of the whatever remainder that we cannot explain. This was at a public hearing. President Obama has, since he's left office, publicly said there's very credible evidence that there are unidentified flying objects somewhat regularly visiting Earth. Now, being called unidentified, that by definition means who knows where they're from. But as I said on your podcast before, as sort of a national security person, I hope to God they're aliens, because if they're <laughs> not, that means Russia or China or Iran or somebody has technology that we can't understand, but is clearly hundreds of years further advanced than our own. So open mystery. It's a great One story, document Brian. sitting in the National Archives is by my grandparents. That's that's fascinating. Chitra, I just tell you one thing that I think that um, it's not just because I'm a science fiction fan. If you consider the hundreds of millions of stars mm -hmm. and all of the galaxies in the universe, the conspiracy theory isn't that there is life out there. The conspiracy theory is that we are uniquely alone and there's no exactly. other life anywhere. It's just statistically the, pros the prospect of us being the only form of sentient being in the universe, or the plan only planet of sentient beings in the universe, is just so infinitesimally small as to be farcical. And then the question is, would they have developed earlier or later than us? And if you consider the age of our sun compared to the age of many other suns in uh, the universe, then again, it's just absurd to think we're the most advanced. In fact, how do depressing would it be if yeah. we're the most advanced creature in the whole universe yeah it's one of those rare things that can be arrogant and depressing at the same time yes <laughs> quite yeah in fact uh brian you mentioned uh mentioned that hearing uh where the naval pilots talked about uh, you know what they saw and and one of the pilots alex dietrich was on my podcast yes. when it mattered oh, and gosh. It has proven to be one of the most popular podcasts. Her name is probably searched more than anybody else's on my podcast, which which shows you even today uh, the level of interest uh, that is you know happening around this whole um, sort of you know question of what what lies out there. And and another really interesting episode on my podcast, which goes exactly to your point, Alex, is um, Adam Frank, who's a professor of astrophysics at the University of Rochester. Uh, he um, was on my podcast and, um, you know, he has just won uh, a NASA grant to look at uh, sort of the exoplanet revolution and looking at techno signatures, you know, what are those sort of the biochemical markers that could show us that there's extraterrestrial uh, intelligence. So I think that there's some really, really groundbreaking work that's going on uh, in this area that you're going to see a lot, lot about in the coming years. Yeah, I, of course, who knows? And I'm not an expert in any of these things. But I, I, my my bet is that maybe not in my lifetime, but in my daughter's lifetime, we will have made um, what Star Trek calls first contact. And I just hope it's positive because, <laughs> you know, there's this whole debate actually in the astrobiology community, if that's the right word, about maybe it's not so smart to be sending these signals out to space because maybe if there are, are, are imperialists out there, if there's Putin on another planet, maybe they see these signals and they say, hmm, lunch. Easy, yeah. Well, look at closing, um, closing this conversation, which has been really, really fascinating. My last question to you both is, when we look back in time, what are we going to remember about this period and technology and how it shaped uh, history and history's narrative? I think we will remember this as a very 
colourful but also sad age in which humanity was desperate to find fault with itself and desperate to pick arguments with itself and that we succeeded despite ourselves. I live in awe of people who get up and start businesses and become entrepreneurs and, uh, and keep going with scientific advances, despite the remarkable downer uh, attitude so many have towards success and the downer attitude so many people have towards society. You know, we spent humanity since the dawn of time in our best moments has tried to say that all, all men are equal, uh, all men and women are equal. Uh, making the necessary or uh, proper alteration to the old phrase all men and women are equal uh, and then right when it's possible that potentially within our grasp we spend our time now telling people that they can't go beyond their original color and that they, in fact they are defined by uh, their gender and their color and they can't possibly have any identity with others who are who look dissimilar to them which i have I've never believed, but I think we're going to succeed despite ourselves. It's an age of incredible technological innovation. It's ex as exciting in, in, its, in its way as the age of the Victorians. And I think that there will be people who look back and say, despite what will be regarded in the future as short-lived lives, I have no doubt people will go on to live much longer lifespans than us. And despite being prey to diseases and conditions which are now common and will one day become pleasingly and satisfyingly rare, I think people will say, they lived a great time of it too. They still knew how to have fun. After all, they haven't banned fun yet and they haven't banned booze. And as long as that's the case, we're still going to have a podcast. <laughs> uh, amen. Amen. I, I, just to paraphrase Churchill, uh, what he said about Americans, let me say about humans. And that was, he said, Americans can always be counted on to do the right thing after they've exhausted all their options. So I'm hoping that for humanity, when we're in our exhaustion period right now, but more seriously, I think two things. One, the, in, and maybe we already know this, but certainly in a hundred years, they're gonna know it. I, I think the, the information revolution, the digitalization of everything and the speed of computers that allow breakthroughs is going to be looked at as more important to human existence and progress than the industrial revolution, than even the Victorian times that Alex talks about. I mean, we are potentially on the cusp of being able to maintain a human being's consciousness electronically literally forever, which for me, that just makes me tired, but it will change the nature <laughs> of human existence. And, and, and similarly, and this is pretty controversial given uh, where Elon Musk in, is, Elon Musk is in the news right now, in May of 2022. But I think this will, this era, the first two decades of the 20th century, first three decades, will be looked at in a thousand years. Easy to say because we'll all be long dead, as the moment when humanity began its ability to get off this planet. Because whether mm. you are, uh, you think it's going to happen because of us uh, neglecting the climate, whether you think it's going to happen because a sun goes supernova, our sun, whether you think it's going to happen because a comet crashes into the earth, humanity, if we're going to survive, will have to get off this planet. And I think we've taken the first steps in the first 20 years of this century. So put that in yeah. your pipe and smoke it. Yeah. Well, Alex and Brian, thank you so much for taking the time to be on Techtopia and for this wonderful discussion on how technology is rewriting history in the oh, making. Oh, thank you so much. It's been great. Our pleasure. Look forward to number four. We'll bring Alex <laughs> back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and more, but well before that, we'll have you on our podcast, Chitra. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Alex Dean and Brian Cunningham are co-hosts of a wonderful new podcast, Hidden History Happy Hour. The podcast was inspired by Alex's book, Lessons from History, Hidden Heroes and Villains from the Past and What We Can Learn from Them. You can listen to their podcast on YouTube and all the major podcast platforms. I link to their podcast on my website and also to Brian's previous episodes on When It Mattered and Techtopia. I highly recommend a listen. This is Techtopia. I'm Chitra Raghavan. Techtopia is a podcast from Good Story, an advisory firm helping technology startups with brand strategy, positioning, and narrative. Our producer is Jeremy Kaur, founder and CEO of Executive Podcasting Solutions, with production assistance from Kate Cruz. Our creative advisor is Adi Weinland, and our research and logistics lead is Sarah Muller, 
Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast platform. And if you like the show, please rate it five stars, leave a review, and do recommend it to your friends, family, and colleagues. For questions, comments, and transcripts, please visit our website at goodstory.io or send us an email at podcast at goodstory.io. Join us next week for another episode of Techtopia. I'll see you then.